Yeah, there. Uh, oh, we're on the air. Oh, we're on the air, yes. Indeed. And we'd like to uh, salute uh, a young lady who pulled off uh, the medical trick of the week in Baltimore. Would you please uh, get me my salute music? Not yet. I'll, I'll give you the cue for it, Larry. You just hold it in there. A 16-year-old Northern High School pupil in Baltimore, that's the name of the school, Northern High School, gave birth today to a seven-pound. I'd like to salute that birth. Gave birth today to a seven pound, 13 and three quarter ounce baby girl in the school's health suite, officials reported. Uh, the mother, who was taken to the hospital after the birth, told hospital officials uh, that she had, quote, no idea that she was pregnant. I don't know what Marcus Welby said about it, but uh, just thought you'd like to know that. Uh, Action continues, it continues, and out there in the darkness, uh, out there in the darkness, bring it in there. That's it. That's it. One can almost hear the flapping of the eternal wings. Uh, your part right now, in case. Uh, you'd like to know, I, I don't suppose we should really tell you this, but because uh, you may get uh, self-conscious, but uh, you're part now of a very interesting anthropological experiment. You're listening to a Borneo native fertility song, and the claim of the Borneo natives who recorded this, incidentally to the anthropologist who put it on tape, that this song has increased the population of that particular tribe over 700% in the last six months. It comes from just hearing it. So would you please turn it up so they can all hear it over in Jersey? This will counteract any pills you might have been taking lately. You never can tell. We have information, by the way, that that chick that was at that high school in Baltimore was one of our listeners. You know, this stuff kind of grows on you after a while, Larry. Just keep it in there. Don't, 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 don't let me... That's all right. They're going, they're going to the next cut. This is even a better one. You know what this is, don't you? This is a male adolescent right. And uh, this is sung upon the male, uh, the male child, as he's approaching his adolescent period. Can you hear the sound of those uh, hollow skulls being rattled against each other? Hear this? That it is claimed that any adolescent male who hears this recording and listens to it for over a 10-second period, will be immediately cursed, and will be cursed to joblessness throughout his adult life. Also, he's going to have a lot of uh, romantic troubles. Now, the reason that this is used, this particular song, you notice it's got a bad hook in it there. The reason that it's used <laughs> is because it's played by native headhunters when they're sneaking up on the other tribe. They're putting the curse on the adolescent boys in the other tribe. All right, oh, that's enough, that's enough. I don't like that. People out there get nervous. I don't blame them, so do I. In fact, I'm sitting there looking at my book of records. You, you, ever, you ever just casually look at your Guinness book of records? Just look at it, you know, just to keep, you know, just to keep things in perspective. Like uh, the other day, this friend of mine, uh, you can find anything in the, you know what the Guinness Book of Records is, don't you? Well, this friend of mine just got divorced, see, and he's, he's really, he's really dragging, man. They're, they're squeezing him. I'll tell you, have you ever, have you ever seen a, a, a turnip press? Have you ever seen a turnip press? You know what a turnip press is? A turnip press is a press that is used to, 
to take a juice out of a turnip. And, uh, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, put it on. That's okay. It doesn't matter. We, we can work with anything. Uh, you take a, a turnip now, if you've never seen a turnip press. A turnip press is, is a press that is used it's just like a, you know, like any other kind of a press. And you put a turnip in it, and then you squeeze the handles together, and theoretically, uh, you get the juice of a turnip out of it. Well, now, there's two problems involved. One is that turnips don't have much juice. You know, you're not going to get swamped by turnip juice much in your life. Uh, the other thing is the turnips are pretty hard. You know, they're not soft like uh, grapes. So when you're squeezing a turnip to get the turnip juice, you've got to squeeze like Billy be damned. And uh, you may have to squeeze five, maybe ten turnips to get maybe uh, two drops of juice. Well, my friend who just got divorced, is like a turnip in a turnip press. I mean, they are squeezing this guy. You wouldn't believe it. And uh, they're going to get juice out of him. Even though he ain't got much juice, they're squeezing his, the soles of his shoes now, see, to get what they can out of it. So he comes in the office, and he's got this real bad look on his face. He's lost 150 pounds in the last three months since he's been divorced. After all, he's given up eating. He can't afford eating anymore. You know, it's... The only eating he does is he sneaks in once in a while and gets a drink out of the free fountain in the H&H. &H. That's about all. See, and he watches people eat a lot. He, he stands around outside of a chock full of nuts and watches people, you know, watch people eat them tuna salad sandwiches and the brownies. And they, he finds it that it gives him a little sustenance, but not enough, really. And he's taken to eating old newspapers. He finds that the, that the post is almost indigestible. Especially Bob Williams. He can't, uh, it just gave him a terrible case. But he finds, however, on the other hand, that he does pretty well with the Times, particularly the Sunday edition. And so he's given up eating. And he's real worried. So he comes in the office the other day, and he's got this bad look on his face. Have you noticed when guys really are in extremis, their eyes start to bulge? They notice this, you know, in places like the, uh, the concentration camps in Germany when they... You know, the guy's eyes bulge because he hasn't eaten for months. You know, you just don't eat. Your eyes bulge and your knees start to hurt. And so he comes hobbling in, say, and his knees are clacking and clanking. He has got, uh, you know, he weighs about maybe 70, 75 pounds. Now, six feet three. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, it's just terrible. I, it's the first time I ever saw a guy had his belt around his waist twice. It just went around him twice, and he had it tied. Uh, you know, his old, he's lost that much weight. Just terrible sight. And he comes walking in, and I look up at him, and I say, what's the matter, Tony? You know, and he says, oh, he says, oh God. He says, I don't know what. He says, he says he's tried everything. He, he, the, he sends his entire paycheck to his wife, see, but that's not enough. That doesn't cover the alimony. So he sends his entire paycheck. So every week, he's like, you know, he's like a, he's like a junkie with a monkey on his back. See, he's taking the snatching purses in the dark, and you know, stealing hubcaps and stuff like that, see? And it all goes to alimony. So I, I says, wait a minute. He says, hold it, Tommy. You ain't got it bad. He says, I ain't got it bad. What are you talking about? How bad or can it be? I says, wait. And I reach back and I get my Guinness Book of Records under divorce. And there's a subtitle under divorce called alimony, the highest amount ever paid. And I whip it out and I said, here it is, uh, Tommy, if you think you got a gripe. The highest alimony ever paid was paid by a man in Lancaster, England, in 1962, when he paid $11,550,000 in alimony. And that did not include child support. Oh, he staggered back, see, because misery does love company. <laughs> I mean, and it made him feel good. You could see the... the for the first time in weeks, I saw a flicker of uh, life, vitality, go across poor old Tony's emaciated map. Uh, it's interesting. His face looks like a skull now. And it ain't easy to see a skull smile. And after all, he's lost over 270 pounds. And uh, that, that skull, I could see the bones, you know, through the skin. And he looked amused and happy to hear that there was a man who had paid more alimony than he is paying. So, uh, misery does love company. I, you know, we don't love our fellow man. We only love him when he's in the same boat that we're in. 
I were giving you a moment to soak that one up. I, I repeat, uh, man does not like his fellow man. He only loves his fellow man when he's in the same boat that he's in. Okay, you can file your objections, and we'll file your objections. But uh, nevertheless, uh, <laughs> it seems to me that's fairly true. So poor old Tony went out. His knees were clacking away there, see? Uh, he felt a little better. I could see that uh, one of his crutches now was moving with a great deal of uh, alacrity. He was moving real quick, you see, for him. And he went on down towards the water cooler to get another drink of water, which is free here. It's about the only thing you get around here free, see? So and, uh, he's taken to eating rubber bands, too. You know, there's... Uh, have you noticed there's a lot uh, there's a lot of sustenance in rubber bands? I wonder how many of you grew up in school eating erasers off pencils. You ever eat erasers off pencils? Of course you did. You're listening to one of the better paste eaters of the Warren G. Harding School. I was very good on paste. You know, that white paste that comes in the jar? It's a very good. And uh, LePage at one time came out with a raspberry-flavored paste. It was really nice. It, it was kind of nice. Uh... Personally, I like the vanilla paste better, the, you know, the conventional. Of course, that's basic conservatism, I suppose. But uh, I like the vanilla paste better. But uh, for a change of pace, the raspberry wasn't bad. Speaking of raspberries, this is W.O.R. New York, of course. Where else? And uh, would you please hit the cheap guitar button, Larry? <laughs> I've got you in my clutches. I got, I have. Very easy there, easy there, easy there. That's it, very nice. Uh, let's see. Uh, if you're a roué type and you'd like to meet the kids... Of, uh, no, 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 that's another commercial. It says, uh, youths. If you're, a, <laughs> if you're a youth type and uh, you'd like to take your vacation where the kids of Europe take their vacation and do all those groovy things that the kids of Europe do, <laughs> and they sure do, especially on the beach... Uh, we would like to suggest that uh, you listen carefully. TAP, the Intercontinental Airline of Portugal, is introducing a youth fair. And it's only 210 bucks. Round trip economy airfare to Portugal. Uh, and the ticket is good for a year. So you can do a lot of meeting kids for a whole year. You can mess around on the beach. Anyone under 26 and over 12 is eligible. And in Portugal, you do all the stuff there, you know. Uh... Meet the European kids in the wine country. Uh, you know where they grow all that Thunderbird? In the ancient castles and the museums. And uh, on the beach, soaking up the sun. The prices are good, the food is good, and the people move real nice. Call your travel agent or TAP at 421-8500. I repeat, 421-8500. Over and out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over the past 32 years, Newsday, the Long Island newspaper, has become one of the great success stories in publishing history. Recently, we started a Sunday edition. And what Newsday has done so well six days a week, we're now doing just as well on Sunday. For example, our coverage of sports. I'm Ed Comerford, sports columnist of Newsday. When we started our Sunday edition, we felt there was an opportunity to do something new and exciting in sports. For example, we doubled the size of our Sunday sports section. This lets us run big action pictures and layouts. It enables us to run more sports news, especially about school sports. And since Newsday isn't trucked out from the city, we can give you late Saturday night results. Saturday is a big day in sports. That's why sports is big in Sunday Newsday. Newsday, Long Island's own Sunday newspaper. No service charge for home delivery. And uh, we have a little note here for you here. And uh, let's see, it's uh, about Le Champ. A restaurant. It says uh, that the commercial here begins. It says, announcer to be read slowly, romantically. <laughs> ah, there you are at an intimate table graced by candlelight. The sounds of strolling, transistorized musicians create a mellow mood as you enjoy a sumptuous dinner prepared in the continental style. 
And then the instruction says louder and a little faster. No, you are not in the Parisian cafe, but in the delightful Le Champ restaurant right in the heart of Manhattan on East 40th Street between the park and Madison. At Le Champ, you'll find not only the authentic French dishes, but also an international cuisine of exotic meat and seafood entree, as well as hearty steaks and the prime tender beebs, all at moderate prices. Then it says drop voice to intimate sound as you hit, and they underline it, hit the address, Le Champ, 25 East 40th Street, between Park and Madison. I repeat, Le Champ. Oh, it's a nice word to say. Try it yourself. Le Champ. 25 East 40th Street between Park and Madison. I have my reasons. I'm not being uh, arbitrary. As you noticed, for a long time, I'm rarely arbitrary. Right? You know, speaking of... I, I wish I could learn to be that way. Arbitrary. You know, you probably get a handbook on how to do it. But uh, while we're on the subject of arbitrariness and the mysterious things that are going on in our world today, you know, I... I uh, I, I, I was sitting there, you know, today reading the paper, <laughs> and, and you know, it, it's it's eerie. It's kind of spooky the way things work. Uh, I was I was. Do you ever watch Adam Twelve? You ever seen that? You've seen it. You know, and everything works so great. I mean, these guys press their button and the radio works and everything works good. You know, and uh, they never they never arrive and it's a false alarm or anything. See. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm fascinated by this, because I think that's one of the things that happens in our life. I think we get bugged because everything works great on television. Uh, on all the TV commercials, for example, if you put stuff in a, in a sink and you got tea stains, the tea stains come out when you put the stuff in the sink, right? Well, I've never had a tea stain in my sink, so I don't know. I I, I don't know of anybody that ever has had one in their sink. <laughs> I, I I've often wondered about that. You know, that's called the non-existent TV dilemma, which the dilemma is proposed, but it never exists in life. I've never seen anybody steal the right guard in life. You know, from the house and take it out, sneak it out of the house in his briefcase. You see it on TV a lot, though. Uh, for example, I have never seen. Uh, and when I've lifted the top of the back of the John off, I've never seen a little guy on a raft back there playing the guitar and talking about blue water. I've never seen this either. Uh, you, know, you, you know, you go through life and you wonder whether or not, you know, they, there must be another world where people do this stuff. And uh, you begin to curse the fact that you have been born into a world of uh, nothingness where nothing really works. I think this is why we go to movies, too. I mean, guys go to movies and... And, uh, you know, people in movies, everything works the way it should work. Uh, you see a southern sheriff in a movie, and he's fat, and he wears black sunglasses, and he keeps calling everybody boy, you know? And that's the way it is in the movies. But you you, you want, you know, you, you meet a real southern sheriff, and he looks a little bit like McGovern. <laughs> I actually met him. He looks and he talks like him. So you begin to think, well, I'm not talking to the real southern sheriff, see? I'm, I'm, uh... The real one is in the in the film with Dustin Hoffman, and uh, so you begin to you begin to doubt your senses, and so here uh, here's a piece that gives you that that uh, that let's say illustrates the point when Thomas Wharton, this is Industry, California, in a great town named Industry. Now, how's that for the work ethic? It's a great town called uh, you know Toil, Pennsylvania, you know a sweat of your brow, Kentucky. But uh, nevertheless, Industry, California, when Thomas Wharton called on sheriff's deputies to rescue him, the deputy smiled and ignored the call. Wharton, recently discharged from the Marine Corps, claimed, and he called up the sheriff. He says, quick, help me. And they said, why? He says, I'm surrounded by ducks. Uh, <laughs> skeptical deputies put the call in the, quote, now we've heard everything class, and they went around their work. You know, they said, the hell with this guy call him, saying he's surrounded by ducks. Wharton called again, asking to be rescued from the quackers. No response. They ignored him. Wharton called a third time, and this time he was really frantic. I mean, his voice was cracking, and you could hear he was crying and yelling, you know, in the phone. He demanded that deputies immediately come out and help him out of his predicament. He said he would hold the telephone up in the air so that the deputies could hear the ducks. 
And he holds it up, and quack, 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 it thousands of ducks, see? Sure enough, over the line came the sound of 28 million ducks. So the deputies rushed out there, and they found him in the middle of a duck farm, surrounded by thousands of angry ducks. And it turns out that poor old Wharton became tired while driving Wednesday night, pulled over to the side, went to look for a telephone, and, uh, you know, he's looking for a phone, see? And all of a sudden, uh, he was surrounded by five million angry ducks, all pecking at him. And he ran like hell into another field. They came over the fence after him. They chased him over five fields, and finally he figured he wasn't going to make it. You know, the ducks were around him. He could see nothing but a sea of ducks. He found a field telephone on a farm, used it to call for help, and was just rescued in the nip of time because they were pulling in his jockey shorts. I mean, you know, I thought to myself, look, you guys are all laughing. You wouldn't see that on Adam 12, quick. I'm going to rescue a guy with 12 million ducks around him because, uh, this, see, this is happens. Because Adam-12 deals with fiction. And Wharton was dealing with life. Ducks. I mean, surrounded by rotten ducks. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to tell you a story, and, I, and I, you're not going to believe it. I don't give a damn whether you do or not. Because it's actually the truth. Now, a lot of you people live in a city, real city, you know. I mean, you live in New York, you live in the Passaic and places like that. And, uh, yeah, you know, West, uh, West Virginia, yeah, well, that's, uh, you know, that's the city, of course. I suppose Beckley could be called a city if you look at it through the wrong end of a spyglass. But, uh, <laughs> I'm not referring to you personally, Larry. I'm using the term here, uh, let's put it this way, editorially. But most people who live in the city, you know, to, the, to them, anything like that is academic. I mean, the, the idea that a guy would be... Do you realize what terror it would be in your gut to be surrounded by, say, 5,000 ducks all with a mad look in the eye? Well, I, you know, to begin with, most people don't think of a duck as a dangerous animal. You know, you don't think of a duck that way. You say, well, you know, a duck, you'd kick the duck. I mean, if the duck got tough, you'd kick the duck. <laughs> There's an old expression that refers to ducks, which we will not bring up at this time. This uh, is in the later work, and it'll be in next semester if you stick with the course. It'll be in the next year's work. But uh, what do you do when you're surrounded by 10,000 ducks? Now, I'm not attempting to pose here what could be called an academic question. I'm saying to you, friends, that out there in the darkness there are things which you have not even contemplated. Now, I'm going to tell you, a story which is going to probably make you sick, many of you. <laughs> I'm very serious. Because because I, I, I approach the animal world with a little trepidation. Because of several things which have happened to me in my lifetime. And I'm going to tell you one of them. It happens to you usually when you're, when you're totally un, unsuspecting. Now, if you're walking around in the African bush, you would not be surprised to be... Uh, ogled by a lion, would you? Really? I mean, you know, you're well, all right. You know, they, they tell you before they, you know, you go there uh, that there are some things out there in the weeds and you better be careful about those things. So you would be prepared for it. Although I will say to you, not really. Now, you know, I was in the African bush. That's right. And I'm not kidding you. Most of you have only been in the African bush by watching a wild kingdom. You know, or Marlon Perkins, our old uh, reruns of Jack Parr home movies, which look like reruns of Jack Parr movies from the start when you see him in the first place. <laughs> but uh, this is what most people think of. See, and, and we all live this way. Most of our lives are lived vicariously. Oh, yeah. I think most people, I mean, most people's idea of war is gained from a lot of movies. I know, you know. Uh, do you agree with that, Larry? newsreels and stuff like that, you know, bits of film on the Walter Cronkite show. So you really think you know what it's about. You, know, you think you've, you even begin to believe you've experienced it after a while. You know, if, you're, if you're a true product of the media, you really do feel you have, ultimately. That, uh, that you've seen Paris, for example, so many times on so many millions of movies that uh, you, you kind of feel you know about Paris. You agree with that? 
So, I mean, you might, you might not, I, I know that New York is that way. People see New York constantly on the screen. Everywhere I go around the country, people have seen New York in a you know, million movies, million TV shows. Eh? New York, you know, how many times? Why, from the very beginning of television, shows were filmed in New York. You remember Naked City? They were always running around on the roofs in New York. You remember that? I, I asked a cop one day, if you ever caught anybody on the roof, he said, been on the force 28 years, never chased nobody on the roof. <laughs> but they were always doing that on, on uh, Naked City. They always wound up running around on the roof uh, for some reason or other. But uh, this, uh, this, this is the way it is. But the actuality of New York is nothing at all like uh, the, the films. Not really. Just faintly. But not really. Because the actuality is bigger. It's shoddier. It's gaudier. It's every other conceivable way. Do you agree with that, Larry? Furthermore, it, it, uh, you never see queens on the TV shows. It's part of New York, you know? So I, I'm, I'm in this... I'm in this car, I'm in a Jeep, as a matter of fact, driving along a road, a, a dusty road in the bush of East Africa. And uh, I've not been in East Africa, in this area, uh, for more than like 10 minutes. And I have left Johannesburg a few hours prior to that. Johannesburg is a big city. Johannesburg is a city about like, uh, would, it reminds me very much of parts of Chicago. So, you know, you never know you're in Africa. And so I got in this plane. We flew for a few, you know, few hours. Next thing you know, I'm in East Africa. Well, now you're in a plane. You're in a plane. You could be in a plane over Trenton. You know, the plane is a plane is a plane. They don't have it uh, coated with zebra skin inside or anything like that. You know, it's just a plane. So we land. Guy meets me. He's in a jeep. We drive out. You see that, that, that already I'm setting it up for, for the danger <laughs> because when you make a quick transition to something, you're not prepared for it. So we're in this car, and air all around me is countryside, and I could smell the air. The air in, in East Africa smells a little bit like a summer day, uh, maybe in Pennsylvania. It's a, it's a smell of, uh, of uh, just fields and things. It doesn't have a distinctive smell. It just smells disarmingly familiar smell these weeds and grass and you hear sounds and what are the sounds you hear just the same sounds you hear in Pennsylvania maybe in Jersey you hear some crickets you know, things go eep <laughs> you know how they go and so we're riding along in this car in this jeep with the top down me and this guy and he's wearing these uh, khaki shorts which was the first touch of exoticism, because they don't often wear khaki shorts in Manhattan. They wear shorts, but not khaki shorts. You know, these brown types? And so we're riding along. We're maybe 20 minutes, we're driving along, and all of a sudden, he slides to a stop. The Jeep just goes, shh, we stop. I said, what's the matter? He said, wait a minute. And they're on the road just laying across the road, about six, seven feet long, was the biggest, meanest, most vicious-looking snake i ever seen in my life. It's just laying across the road. I said, what is it? He says, a Bushmaster. I said, a Bushmaster? He says, yeah. He said, that baby hit you, you got about eight seconds. He says, eight quick seconds. I said, what are we going to do? He said, well, he'll move. We sat there for a minute, and the Bushmaster's looking around. I see that head coming up, see? He senses something in the immediate vicinity. Something that smelled a little bit like uh, tonight's dinner, namely me. His head comes up, looks around, see? Sure enough, he starts to ooze across that, that one-track road. See, we couldn't go off the road because on either side of us, there were two of these like, kind of drifting off bankments and, and uh, ditches and stuff. You'd wind up in, the, in real problems, see. And this thing just goes, he just oozes across. Well, now I've seen snakes before. I can take a snake in my own stride. So I figured, well, a snake's a snake, you know. Seen plenty of snakes. Where I've been, yeah, plenty of snakes. 
And so he puts that baby in gear, and we drove on. So this is this is all there is to this. This is not a snake. So you get a snake, you know. We drove on for about five minutes, and we turn around a bend, and again he stops. He says, Shh, "Wait, just a minute." He stops the jeep, and off to our right, I see standing next to two little short trees, a giraffe. I mean, he was as big as the Empire State Building. I couldn't believe it. And he's looking right at us. That high, thin neck that just moves vaguely. Now, you've seen giraffes, haven't you, in zoos? I submit to you, you have not seen a giraffe. A giraffe in a zoo. I'll tell you the difference, really, basically. You've probably seen rifles in sporting goods stores. You've seen pistols in, you know, just in cases and things. Have you ever seen a pistol in the hand of somebody pointed right at your head? That's a different sight. (laughs) No, it gives it a whole different context. Not that the zebra or the the uh, the giraffe. Not that the giraffe is dangerous. Not at all. But it's eerie to see this giraffe standing up against the sky, his head moving. It was the first time I was aware of something with giraffes too. First of all, giraffes in the wild—they're like twice the size of giraffes that are walking around in zoos. I learned this to be a fact later. They grow to be maybe 23, 24 feet tall. That's a lot of, a lot of animal. Big. Oh, he's big. His head's moving like that. See, and he's looking straight at us. And his head is way up in the sky. Incredible. Looking down, see. And I'm looking up. And I see something sitting on the top of his head. It's a bird. He has this bird that works with him. Yeah, the bird works with him, see. He just moves back and forth. The bird's sitting on top of his head. The bird's looking at me, and the giraffe is looking at me, and I'm looking at the giraffe, and the bird's looking back. And the guy in the Jeep next to me says, That's a big one. He's seen a lot of them. I said, He sure is. He said, He's big. I said, He is. I don't know what made me turn. Something caught my eye, and I turned to my left. Just, just like that, uh, curious, uh, maybe it's instinct, I don't know. I just turned to my left like that, and the giraffe was off to my right, remember. I turned to my left, and here is high weeds, bushes, that were maybe 10, 15 feet tall. Right, came right to the edge of the jeep, right along this road here. I turned, I couldn't believe what I'm seeing. Looking out of the bushes, right at me, right at me. No more than from me, from here to that glass right there. No more than maybe five feet away. I mean five feet away. Looking right at me. Is a bull elephant. He had ears that stretched from here to Staten Island. You ever seen a bull elephant's ears? The big fan-shaped ones. Different from Indian elephants, you know. Big fan-shaped ears, see. And he is so high up in the sky, I tell you, I got a crick in the neck looking up at him. There he is looking down at me, and I'm looking at him. See, and he's got this big trunk moving up like that. And I said to the guy in the Jeep, I says, look behind and to the left. He looks up, and he says, sit still. He eases the Jeep in the first. He waited a split second to make sure nothing was going to happen. And then stepped on it real good. And that jeep just dug in and kicked up a cloud of dust. Well, we went about a hundred yards, and he says, My God, he says, that's the first time one snuck up on me like this guy's a guide. He says, What? <laughs> he says, This is a fantastic day. I says, It is, is it? You know, I, I thought maybe this was an atypical day, and uh, it was. It was that, that moment of sudden realization that nothing is the way it seems to be when you're watching it on the movies. When you see it in real life, it's a totally different thing. And then I could smell the elephant. You could just smell it. It's a funny smell. That, that, 
It doesn't smell really like zoos either. There's a smell to a to a big walking around wild African elephant. That's a lot of a lot of meat on the hoof, and they move real fast. Oh, they they go good. So I took a look at that thing, you know, and he's moving now parallel to us. He's just looking us over. He's not afraid, you know. He knows where he's, he knows where he is, you know. <laughs> he doesn't have to worry. He's the chief there, see. So he moves around just sort of casually loping through the undergrowth. And then the next thing hit me, he moves with absolutely no sound whatsoever. Is not a slightest rustle. You can't figure how they can move those tons of flesh. Through the, through, the, through the thick brush, thick brush. I mean, I'm not talking about little weeds. I'm talking about thick brush. Not a sound. He's just moving through it. Then I became aware that he was not alone. And all around him, see, he's just the chief of the crowd. All around him, you could see these black, uh, sudden flashes and occasional eyes. Must have been 30, 40 of them. They were all around us, just moving across the road. We just sat there, and they moved across the road ahead of us once in a while he'd look over at us with them mean red eyes and just waiting for you know any funny move under that hood of that jeep and forget it it's junk he making it a very quick junk it's a used car awful sudden so he so I'm sitting there watching this thing he says my god that's fantastic scene what a scene well then then I'm, I'm hit by this see I said to him, "Well, I, I'm beginning to doubt my senses after this. I don't, I don't, I don't push, I don't push any closer." And then, reading that story, of that guy and those ducks. Now I want to tell you, you're laughing at that poor guy sitting out there with all them ducks around him. You know, all those ducks yelling at him. You say that's ridiculous. Now well, listen, I was a paper boy one time. You know what is the paper boy? You know the guy that goes around in the morning delivers your paper. Well, I, I had a paper route. And uh, when you have a paper out for a couple of years, you see the underbelly of life. You really do, especially if it's early morning and especially if the paper out is in, uh, you know, just a, just a big industrial town like I was a paper route boy in, a big industrial town. And a lot of, you know, a lot of vacant lots and prairies and junk. And every morning I'd get out, I had this bike, see, and I would, I would take the Chicago Trib is what I was dealing in. And I would, I would throw the Chicago Tribs up on porches at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning in rain and in snow. Well, one day, about 4.30, 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, something like that, I got started very early. See, the papers came in at 4.30. We got out on our route about 5. And I got, I'm moving along maybe 5.15, 5.30, something like that. The route was more than 5, 10, 15 minutes long. I'm just getting into it this morning, see. And your head, when you do a job... When you do a job over and over and over and over and over and over again, your head gets to kind of be in another place when you do it. It becomes routine. You agree with that? Your head just moves in another direction. And I, I was operating totally instinctually. I'm throwing the papers, making them into the thing, you know, I'm throwing them up again. And I, I developed a fantastic sidearm. I could you know, zip under the sidearm swing like that up into the up into the porches. Well, I missed one. It bounced off the screen door and fell down off the porch and bounced down into the weeds of a side yard that had a little fence around it. You ready for this, friends? I had never walked into this house before. I had always just thrown the paper up there and once in a while on a Saturday morning I would go and collect there. I would go up to the front porch knock on the door and they would give me the money but now the paper is down in the lilac bushes next to the house there with the fence around it on the side porch which was controlled by this wire fence well without thinking I opened the fence closed the fence walked through the grasses just getting light out just getting light there was nothing but dew all around. Total peace. So I ducked down and I crawled down under the lilac bush and grabbed the Chicago trip. I start backing out. When I hear the first sound, it was a sound, no, I'll never forget it. It just went, <sighs> just like that. Well, I figured there's a snake around here. What the hell's a snake? 
it goes again. I couldn't see anything at first. Now I am out of the bushes on my hands and knees. And they're looking right at me. Between me and the, the gate were two mean, big, snake-like, vicious geese. Pure white geese. Well, I, I got to my feet. See, I was down on my hands and knees, and these two things were, were squatting down with their, with their wings outspread. And you could see this light was just beginning to touch them, and they were white, and they had strange staring eyes, and their beaks were open. They had these bright yellow beaks, and they were open, and the beaks just kept going, ah, ah, that curious, like they were gasping. Well, I back away towards the fence, and these two geese started to move toward me. Two giant geese. I never saw such big birds in my life. Now, I had never really ever in my life up to that point been close to a goose. Geese were academic to me. There were things you read about in fairy stories, you know, geese, mother... Mother Hubbard and all that jazz. These two great big white mean looking mothers came moving towards me with these wide staring eyes. They were yellow. They, I remember the eyes were yellow. I looked at them. Uh, some images you just don't get out of your mind. They were yellow staring eyes with big black dots in the middle of them. And they just kept moving. And they had little sharp pointed tongues like, like little tiny razors. Ah! Ah! And moving towards me. Oh, my God. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I starts backing up. Well, the fence was about six feet high. Now I knew why they had the fence. And I am plastered up against the fence, and these two geese came kissing at me. <sighs> and one is on each side. They're moving towards me. And I see, I couldn't believe it. Coming out from under the bushes, there's three more moving in. Now, I will guarantee you, at that point in my life, I would say it didn't take more than two geese to outweigh me. And I could tell they were in better shape. For being geese, that is. And their mouths were wide open and those eyes were staring. While I am back into the corner, I stood there for about 15 minutes. Afraid to move. And afraid to move. And they just kept circling me, going, ah, 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 ah. Well, I finally did the only thing I, I could think to do. I had that paper, see, and I took the paper and I threw it up against a window of this house. I finally had an idea and I banged the window with it, see. And sure enough, about a minute and a half later, somebody slammed the window open and hollered, What do you want? What's going on? I, I still... And the guy looks down and he sees his geese have got me trapped. He's hopping right down. And five minutes later, this guy's put on his pajamas or whatever he had to put on in his shoes and he's down there and he's pushing them geese back with a big stick and he turns to me and he says don't ever come in this yard again he says they'll kill you I said they'll what? he says they'll kill you I said okay okay I won't <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> I went back out and I got on my Elgin bike I never went back in that yard Simple as that. Never forgot it either. So don't laugh at a guy surrounded by ducks. God knows you may be surrounded by frogs yourself one day. Eat frogs. This is WOR in New York. You stay tuned for Lester Smith and the News. News and detail on the hour from the WOR newsroom. This late word, a bomb explosion aboard an American Airlines plane while in flight, but no deaths. Eleven persons injured. According to first reports, none seriously. The explosion occurred in the baggage compartment of a plane, a DC-10, that had just taken off from Detroit on a flight to Buffalo, New York, when the bomb went off. The pilot made an emergency landing, but the plane veered off the runway and it is possible that that's when the injuries occurred. There's a difference in statements on what damage the plane suffered. The air traffic control tower at the Detroit airport says the damage was minor. Sheriff's office says a hole was torn in the tail section. 
Delivery of the first edition of the New York Daily News was a little late in hitting the stands tonight due to a strike by the newspaper's security guards. But with the aid of helmeted police, the trucks rolled. However, the paper faces a total shutdown on Thursday if the guards do not return to work. This, according to W.H. James, president of the news, the dispute is over wages. Drivers of the trucks belong to a different union, and they are not involved in the strike. They were told by the paper to drive their vehicles, but only if they thought it safe to do so. Despite a court order to the contrary, Local 1199 Drug and Hospital Union plans a work stoppage tomorrow against the New York City Voluntary Hospitals. The union is made up of the non-medical employees. The contract dispute over the protest of the union was submitted today to binding arbitration. The union is demanding a negotiated settlement. 2,500 members of the National Guard and another 2,000 volunteers are continuing the search for additional victims of the Rapid City, South Dakota flood. But the fear is that many bodies never will be found that they've been washed away forever into the waters of the Missouri and Mississippi rivers and of the Gulf. The official death toll has been revised downward to 187. About 400 others are believed missing. Here is an eyewitness report. I uh, turned on the backyard light, and I saw water coming in into the, to the backyard. And uh, I turned and run, told my friend that we have to get out of here, and we got into the car and backed out, and by the time we got in the car and backed out, the water was already a foot and a half, two feet deep. And I would say the water rose at a rate of three to four feet in five to ten minutes. And uh, too many people were lost. They had no warning at all when the wall of water hit. Uh, Some of your neighbors were not as lucky. No. There's several families that's lost, and some have been found there, some haven't. They're dead, and some of them haven't been recovered yet.